So this 20 minute chat is going to be largely about an exercise that I've kind of been involved in for about the last 10 years, which is a way of trying to better allocate food to food banks across the United States and as part of that try to get more food. Okay. So um, let me kind of quickly go through, I'll go through this relatively quickly. This will have more regressions and even maybe an equation or two relative to most of the stuff we've had. So all of this has to do with a big not-for-profit in the U.S. called Feeding America. It was called America's Second Harvest when I started getting involved. And what we, they do is, to a first approximation, get food from distributors. A lot of the food that goes to feeding the poor through food banks and food pantries largely comes from manufacturers or distributors. And what, about 10 years ago, I was asked to get involved in redesigning an algorithm that would essentially get food in a better way to those people. So we, they allocate a lot of food. Okay, so this is, when we start, it was on the order of, you know, 200 million pounds. You'll see that we're, you know, 350, something like that now. Um, and largely, it was a way of trying to better match the demands of local areas to the set of available foods that are out there. So. Um, there's one kind of obvious way in which I could kind of tackle this problem, which is, you know, it's about getting food to poor people, so it clearly has that sense of inequality. Um, I'll give you some facts to try and show you that it looks like that seems to have worked, but I thought I would take this opportunity to take a different angle, okay, which is the following. I'm surprised this hasn't come up much in the context of the talk, or the conference, I should say, but it strikes me that one of the biggest problems that market designers have at the moment is the idea that in many people's minds, markets have a fundamental unfairness about them, which is people with certain attributes tend to benefit more than others. You know, we're used to seeing work on inequality where the returns to ability have gone up like crazy, but it's also true with respect to things like financial literacy. One of the things I'm gonna deal with here is the size of the food bank. You know, and one of the things you worry about, for example, in the context of the refugee debate is what if like some refugees know where to live and other people don't? You know, suppose some people know that living in Bradford's great and living in Surrey's terrible, or even they know what attributes to ask for. You know, so I, I think one of the fundamental issues that maybe market designers have to think about is how it affects inequality among participants. And the reason I'm kind of focusing on that here is that if we had not solved this problem, okay, namely, there was a huge concern among food bankers all across the US that when we start to introduce this thing that's based on choice or based on a market, some people benefit much more than others. So some people get hosed, basically. And the reason why it worked, and I'll try and show you that I think it did work, is because I think we solved that problem. And that was the first order problem, rather than just sort of walking in and telling people markets are good, okay? And we introduced a whole pile of checks and balances. And ultimately, what I think I'm going to try to do here is show you that, you know, despite and opposite the impression of many people of markets, the group that was sort of seen as the disenfranchised group, in our example, these are the small food banks. You're in West Virginia, you basically have no employees. Chicago has 200 people walking around. There was a real concern that Chicago was gonna benefit relative to Idaho. But what I'm gonna try and do is I'm gonna show you that Idaho benefit most. And that's largely because we introduced this bunch of checks and balances, okay? All right, so um, here's the way it used to be. The, the easiest way I can do this is kind of do a before and after exercise, okay? So here's what happened when I got involved. And so I get involved and Feeding America every day gets a phone call from Kraft, from Kroger, from Walmart, whoever it happens to be, to say, I have a truckload of X. I have a truckload of cereal, I have a truckload of broccoli. Who do you give it to? Okay, so the way that they used to do it was they would basically have what's called the, the one piece of jargon that you need to know is this thing called the goal factor. The goal factor is essentially how many poor people do you have relative to everyone else in the US. So it's a combination of poverty rates and population levels. So think of like the fraction of food that you get, or your priority, I should say, is basically how poor you are relative to the total number of poor, excuse me, poor people in the United States. So what they would do is they'd have a ranking. And then what would happen is a truckload would become available. So typically you would get like 30 truckloads in a day. And what they would do is they would basically allocate, essentially based on where you were in the rank. So like if Chicago Food Depository was number three on the rank, they would get something. After they were given that, their goal factor would go down because they would have, sorry, the number of pounds they got relative to their goal factor would go down, would go up. And what they would do is they would go down the rank. So essentially it was an algorithm, very simple algorithm, but it was based on poverty rates for your area relative to other places, okay? So just so you do that, so we can do this sort of before and after exercise, 
here's a simple regression which I hope you can read. Okay, so essentially what this shows you is the following, which is suppose you're you have one percent more poor people. Okay, that means your gold factor goes up by one percent. Okay, you get one percent more food. So basically, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the number of pounds of food that you get and the number of poor people that you got. Okay, and the reason I'm giving you this is that this has totally changed ex post. Okay, <coughs> so, and this is largely with respect to the welfare gains that I'm going to try and show you. So we introduced them, sorry, in 2005. So this is the data from 2002 to 2004. Okay. Wait, so just to clarify, this this goal factor number uh, is it? It's always fixed or? No changes, like every quarter we get new information. So your poverty level, this is your poverty level. But what we do is we rank you on how many pounds of food you have got relative to the poverty level. I see, so if you, holding fixed my constituency, if you give me one more pound of food, my goal factor is Correct. No, no, not your goal factor, but basically the number of pounds you have, your ranking of pounds relative to goal factor changes. So here's Those the Those are standard errors, not T-statistics, I assume. Despite, uh, the, yeah, yeah, they they're 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 despite the, the label does say cheese statistics. Oh, right? I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair point. No, 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 those are standard. Everything is like super simple. It's a tight one. Yeah, okay. Um, so here's the reason it's kind of a non-trivial issue, which is the two, the three big problems that we have to worry about. The one is there's a lot of spoilage that happens in this industry. Like suppose that I give you broccoli and you already have tons of produce. It just rots. It ends up being animal feed. It doesn't go to feed poor people. Okay, second thing is there's also a big capacity constraint here, which is refrigeration, which is if you have yogurt and I give you milk, it goes off. Okay, so it's not the case there's always some poor people who's gonna take it, gonna take it. The bigger issue, and this was uh, the big part of the welfare gains that I'm gonna, or the imagined welfare gains that I'm gonna try and show you has to do with the following. Feeding America gives out about 20% of all the food that they get. They get 80% of food from other sources, but we have no idea what other food you've got. So think of this as like a general equilibrium problem where there's some unknown endowment that you have. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to match what I should give you based on your endowment, okay, or what I imagine your endowment to be. So the big issue here is the following, and I'm gonna show you this afterwards, which is if you're food rich, so you're Chicago, you have tons of access to other distributors. What that means is you don't need produce anymore because you've got tons of it. And actually what you want is the really good stuff. You want chicken, you want cereal, and what I'm gonna show you is that the welfare gains largely occur on the dimension of this quality quantity trade-off, okay? And then the other thing that has happened, actually that happened a lot, is that the last thing you want to do with someone like Walmart, see the stuff is sitting at their warehouse and you have to go get it, okay? The last thing you want to do is tell Walmart you're going to pick the thing up and then you don't, okay? That'll just piss them off and they'll probably not give you anything again. So you have to make sure that if you say yes, you take the thing, okay? So the problem, the other problem that we had was that uh, Feeding America would just turn stuff down. They would say, look, we don't think we can move it, so we're gonna turn it down, okay? All right, so what did we do? So what we did was come up with this fake money, okay? We call them shares. And now what happens is you get money, your budgets are basically based on your goal factor relative to everybody else's, okay? And then what you would do is every morning, there's a website which I will show you in two seconds, um, and what they do is they bid, okay? They bid in this fake money. We have a sealed bid, first price auction. I won't go into the details of why it ended up first price. We did a whole pile of stuff, basically, to make it easier for the small guys. One was sealed bids, so you couldn't have the big guys checking at the last second, it was cheap. We also have joint bidding. So what happens is there's an indivisibility here, which is a truckload. But if you're West Virginia, you don't need a truckload of, of yogurt. You need a third of a truckload of yogurt. So what you do is you go in with two other guys, okay, and you bid. We also have credit for small guys, so basically we act like a little bank, so the small guys can actually go and get credit if they don't have enough money in the bank themselves. And, sorry this is small, but that's essentially what the website looks like, which is every morning you log in, and what it will do is it will tell you what the options are, so basically you have dairy products here, you have beverages here, okay, it'll tell you how many credits, how many shares you have, how many credit shares you have, it tells you where it is, it tells you what the weight is, and you basically bid, okay. So I'm gonna to try to show you um, a couple of benefits that have actually happened, okay? So- Do they sell? Pardon me? If, if they have extra stuff in their warehouse, can they put it up to sell it? Yeah, so essentially what we've done is, uh, I won't go into the details here, but one of the things that we've done is we've allowed food banks to put their own food on the market, and they get the money from that. So these are- What do you mean shares? Shares, shares. sorry, shares, yeah. I use money in the kind of fake money sense, yes. They get shares for this, yeah. Uh, so that, that basically they can do it. Now, 
If I have time, I'll come back and I'll tell you how much. The people put in, the total is about 15 million pounds a year from those, which is a little smaller than we guessed at the beginning, but I'll talk about that at the end if I have time. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm going to show you is huge dispersion in preferences. And I mean that in two sense, okay? The first sense I mean is dispersing across different goods, okay? So if you take a look at this, you will see, hopefully you can see this, okay? So this is the range of goods essentially from the most expensive to the least expensive. Okay, so what you can see is for a pound of cereal, you'll pay three shares. Okay, this is relative, sorry, to the, it's been normalized to one. But produce, the way it works is you can get one pound of cereal for 110 pounds of produce. Okay, even though the old system treated it as one for one. Okay, huge dispersion. Now of course, and you can see this in another way. So here's what I've done is I've actually shown you the supply of goods, okay? So the red is the supply of goods. So 40% of the goods that we give out, they give out, are either produce or their beverages. So this could be fizzy drinks, it could be orange juice, okay? And then the green one is basically the same thing but with expenditure shares, okay? So what you can see is the two poorest, the two most common goods, namely produce and beverages, 40% of goods but 6% of expenditure, okay? So the, what's happened as a result of the system is that there's an enormous amount of really cheap goods out there. And the small guys are basically spending a ton of their money on these small cheap goods. And I'll show you what the data is. But the quid pro quo, okay, is that the big guys, the Chicago's, the LA's, they don't bid for that stuff. They bid for cereal, okay? And they pay through the notes for it, okay? And that's been kind of like the, the bottom of it. So that's the welfare game. Okay, so all of this wouldn't matter, of course, if everybody could got an equal share of everything. Okay, we'd be just kind of relabeling stuff and just attaching prices, it's a big deal. What this is, is this is the revealed preference over a six year period from 2005, that came into being in 2005, from 2005 to 2011, okay? And asks, what's the average price for a pound of food that you paid over that entire time period, okay? So what it's looking at is, think of this as permanent sorting on quality quantity dimension, okay? So what you can see is there are some people over here that are basically getting 10, 15 pounds of food, okay, for every share that they spent. Okay, just to normalize what it would have been under the old system, it would have been three. So these guys are getting three, four times as much food as they did before, okay? Then you've got a bunch of people that are getting like a third of what they got before. But they're not buying the same stuff, they're buying expensive stuff. So essentially what it's doing is, I'm just, what I'm trying to show you here is that there's enormous amount of sorting on quality, quantity, dimension. In a way, the old algorithm just didn't get. And to be fair to Feeding America, the problem they had is they knew LA probably wanted expensive stuff, but they really faced this constraint in terms of being transparent, and also they didn't know what weights to attach to things. One of the great, I think, advantages of this is price discovery, which is we know what the marginal rate of substitution between goods is now, in a way that they didn't know, and even if they did, they probably couldn't have acted on because there might be an agreement among everybody as to what it was. Here, it's pretty crystal clear. Second benefit, okay, so um, again, one of the things we try to use this system, and sometimes this leads back to the discussion about refugees, okay, which is maybe by setting up this more efficient algorithm, people are more willing to accept. One of the things we tried to do here was set up uh, the system such that firms would be more willing to give and Feeding America would be more willing to accept. The increase in supply is huge here. Um, within seven months, we were up 60 million pounds. Um, if you look across, within a year, you can see this is pretty much permanent. You know, conservatively, I would say we're up 100 million pounds. Okay, so to give you sort of ballpark of that, that's equivalent. So the average person eats about four pounds of food a day. This is like the analog, the equivalent to like 80,000 people a day eating more, that eating that in a way that they didn't before. Okay, so just in terms of pure supply welfare gains. The more general point that I want to do is, since I'm trying to, you know, say something a little bit more general, I have about five minutes left, is that right? Yeah. Oh, right at the back? Okay, five-ish, okay. I'll take that as five-ish. Um, okay, so what did we do? Like, how did we manage to increase supply? Well, one way, we actually, in some sense, do the same tricks that like, lots of places do. Okay, the first is information. You know, if you think about what the average charity does, like, they'll give you a picture of a very poor person, and that would be the sense that that's what we're gonna do, but they also use things like expense ratios, okay, which is the money will actually go. One of the things we do is, what they do is, we go to, um, the distributors and we say, look, this stuff's going to get used. And more than that, we can show you that, look, people really want pasta, so you give us pasta. You know, so you can use the data in an information sense. The second effect, which I think is much more important, okay, actually has to do with the same trick like the financial exchanges do, which is one way of getting supplies liquidity. 
okay, in financial exchanges, it's because bid ask spreads go down. But now what happens is the market is so liquid that Feeding America will just take stuff because they know they can move it. Whereas previously, they never thought they could move it, so they turn a whole pile of stuff down. So essentially, the trick we're doing is we're kind of using liquidity as a way of trying to overcome the problem. And then the other thing which I think might be of use to like thinking about this in the context of other market design settings is we've actually had to kind of tweak the system to get supply. I mean, there's a characteristic, I think, of a lot of the classic market design settings, which is they're very pristine in the sense that we have a bunch of demand, we have a bunch of supply, and now we're trying to work out who gets what. One of the questions that we had to deal with was, to what extent do you have to like tweak the design system to get people to give? Okay? And the tweak that we had to make here, the bend we had to make here is, we basically, in general, you don't want to make people take stuff they don't want. We make people, not make, we induce people to take stuff they don't want. And the way we do it is we have negative prices. Basically, we give you shares to take stuff. So why do we do this? The reason we do this is that donors have their own objectives too. Walmart wants to get stuff off its warehouse. So they want you to take the bad stuff if they're going to give you the good stuff. Okay? And so the tweak that we had to make here was largely to introduce negative prices. What you can see is at the beginning, people didn't really know how to bid that well. And there wasn't a lot of bidding in the first year. So you found that there weren't that many negative prices, so there were a lot of negative prices, but now we're down to about 4%. Okay? But it is the kind of tweak that we've made to try and induce more supply. Um, here is the, if I've got like three minutes left, um, here is the last piece, which is I said to you that one of the things we had to try to sort out was this idea that some people benefit relative to others, this sense of inequality. So remember what I told you is I told you beforehand a 1% increase in your goal factor, your metric of poverty got you 1% of food. This has gone down to about 0.4. Okay? So this is the simplest way for me to try and show you that I think the big welfare gains that have actually happened. So the blue line <coughs> is the number of pounds of food that you get based on your measure of poverty, which to a first approximation means whether you're a big food bank or a small food bank. Okay? So the guys out on the right hand side here are Chicago, LA, New York, Philadelphia, here we're at West Virginia. Okay? The red line is what would have happened had supply changed but the relationship between poverty and pounds achieved stayed constant. Okay? So if you look at the difference between the red and the blue line, what you can see is basically every single small food bank responded to this change in the process by just getting cheap food and lots of food. Okay, so these previously they did not have access to a ton of food and that was the thing they would complain about. Now what they do is they sort on the quality quantity dimension. The relative prices are really small for this kind of food. Like the welfare gain occurs through the, gen the classic general equilibrium effect, which is relative prices are so low for the relatively cheap food. Now, I want to do, so that the last thing I have to do here, so what's the change? So I told you some of this already, which is the big guys buy expensive stuff, but it's also the big guys don't spend some of their shares because they have to pay for transportation. So actually there's permanent non-expenditure among some of the big guys. Okay, last thing I'll do in my last one minute. Okay, sorry, one thing I should say, which is there's actually a- But their shares are fake money. Yeah. Yeah, but they have to pay real money. You gotta pay real money to pay for the truck. That's so they the sold thing. it out of the shares, hoping a big bunch of cereals gonna come along? They're hoping some, well actually if you look at it, what, what we do is actually we now cap the amount of shares that you get. Once you hit 200,000, you don't get any more. So there's actually some people sitting on a cap and they've been sitting on that cap for about two years. Yeah. They're waiting for some really good cereal. Well, <laughs> they're, not they're not buying all of the cereal. Totally. I mean, there's, there's clearly a transversality condition that you got to think about here. And <laughs> some of it's altruism, to be honest with you. Some of it is that they're saying, look, you should get this stuff. Okay? So I think there's a piece of it that's there. Yeah. What's the difference between your relative prices and the one in the grocery stores? Yeah, well, I want to see that graph too. Enormous. Like, you can do the following, which is think about the price of a pound of broccoli compared to the price of a pound of cereal. That's close to one for one in the... But you could show us a graph with your prices versus, totally, versus totally. that would be great. So, so the way that I'm doing here is I'm thinking about this. This is residual demand. There is huge dispersion in residual demand, okay, relative to what you would have. And in fact, here's one of the other kind of, I think, cool things about it, which is a margin I never thought of beforehand, which is all food banks have money, okay? They all raise money from various things. But if you look at what the small food banks are doing now with their money, they used to go and buy food with it. Now what they do is they buy a truck. And essentially what they do is they go off and get the food for essentially nothing. And that's been kind of this margin of, that we've actually talked about. All right, one second. One second to finish. 
So here's sort of the last question that I wanted to try, which is the other sort of conceptual question, I think, which is a useful one to think about, which is, okay, you're feeding America, okay? You know you had this really screwed up algorithm beforehand, okay? How much better could we have done, okay? So suppose I, do, I run two horse races, okay? So here's the horse race I'm gonna do, which is, I'm gonna say a food bank basically tries to rebalance within a month or two period. So take a two month period, okay? And then I'm gonna ask, how well could I have designed an algorithm to do better than they did. Okay, so here's two things that you could do, okay, which is, the first is, I could just give you your goal factor. And I could say, based on what I see as observable data, how well could I predict what you're gonna do? Okay, now I'm not saying that it's, I'm not gonna give you the slope of one, I'm gonna use the equilibrium slope. Okay, suppose I knew what the equilibrium slope was. I can only explain an additional 15% of the variance. So I get about 15% of, tr of the truth by knowing how poor you are. If I include fixed effects, I do way better. Okay, I get to about 50%, okay? So in other words, even within these poverty levels, there's a ton of dispersion, okay? But it's also the case that even knowing your fixed effect, I still can't explain half of what you do. So some of it's just transitory stuff. So in some sense, the point, that the final point here is just to say, look, if I'm feeding America and I'm trying to write some algorithm, I can't do very well. Even with everything that I've given you, I still can't do very well. And that's kind of like the final point about how if you can use something that involves choice and doesn't screw things up too much, that's that's, it works for you. you don't know when the church groups are gonna show up in Idaho and dump a bunch of stuff. Totally, I don't know whether they gave you yogurt this year, this week. And if they gave you yogurt, you don't need yogurt. And I'm not gonna go through this, but it surely has to be a rule we have to have an equation in any economics conference. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. <laughs>